Hello and welcome here again live to the World Crypto Network. We're here having a really, really interesting discussion uh, about agorism and counter economics and the art of walking away. I'm joined here tonight uh, by Sal, the agorist. How are you doing, Sal? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. I love the show and I love the title, uh, How to Walk Away. It's great. Right? Because that is what, what agorism is fundamentally about. Just to you know, be peaceful and do your thing. Just remove yourself from the from the state institutions. That's the best way to look at it. Just walk away. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so Sal here has a, a great website, uh, saldiagoras.com, and a phenomenal podcast called The Agora, The Marketplace. Uh, and uh, we are going to start this off today with a reading, uh, The New Libertarian Manifesto by Samuel Edward Konkin III. This is basically, you know, the book on agorism where SAK3 introduced the concept. And we're going to start with statism, our condition. We are coerced by our fellow human beings. Since they have the ability to choose to do otherwise, our condition need not be thus. Coercion is immoral, inefficient and unnecessary for human life and fulfillment. Those who wish to be supine as their neighbors prey on them are free to so choose. This manifesto is for those who choose otherwise to fight back. To combat coercion, one must understand it. More importantly, one must understand what one is fighting for as much as one is fighting against. Blind reaction goes in all directions negative to the source of oppression and the dispersed opportunity. Pursuit of a common goal focuses the opponents and allows formation of coherent strategy and tactics. Diffuse coercion is optimally handled by local, immediate self-defense. Though the market may develop larger social businesses for protection and restoration, random threats of violence can only be dealt with roots of mysticism and delusions planted deep in the victim's thinking. Required requires a grand strategy and a catalytic point of historical singularity. Revolution. So, Sal, what, what do you think about this amazing book uh, by SAK3? Well, it's definitely like you said. It's definitely the book to read on agorism. Um, it certainly is one of my favorite books on libertarianism. Um, there's a great uh, audio version you can find on YouTube read by John Lowe. And the guy's voice is so perfect for that book, especially the beginning, the opening lines, because it's so dramatic, you know. Um, yeah, this is really, like I said, this is the book to read. It goes through, it defines agorism. It talks about how to deal with the state, what an agorist is, the phases of the revolution. I mean, really, this is the one to read if you want to know about agorism. Also, uh, uh, the agorist primer is a good one. A third one that we could have mentioned is um, Alongside Night by J. Neil Shulman. And although that is a fiction book, it was written to portray what a counter-economic revolution would look like. <clears throat> so either one of those three would be good. This is, I think, the best one, though. Oh, yeah, as always, there are many, many great books to read. And uh, this is just a way that you can convey information. Uh, but fundamentally, it's up to you to understand this information and then to act upon it. Right? That's and the way it's written, the tone of the author, the tone of Konkin, it's like so, it makes you want to go out and have a revolution as soon as you read it. You know what I mean? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, Sal, your, your, twi uh, your Twitter handle and, of course, your podcast is titled Agorism. Uh, so, you know, just basics uh, for, for, you know, the, the everyday layman. W what do you define agorism? I define agorism <clears throat> as, uh, I guess I would say, to me, agorism is the application of logical consistency to political science and economics. It's what happens. It's the natural result of applying logic to the social sciences. You inevitably come up with agorism. Really, all it is is just the free market working. Um, 
you know, drop out of the state institutions, decentralization. Anytime you can move, a, you can provide a market alternative for the state, or you can uh, you can provide an alternative, a uh, black market alternative uh, to state regulation, like for example, Ross Ulbricht or Cody Wilson. These guys are are heroes. Um, you know, another one who I really like is Erwin Schiff. Um, you can also look at people like Lavoie Finicum. These are these are heroes. And you know, one thing that uh, Adam said last time you guys were speaking, which I really disagreed with, was when he said, you know, look, there's no revolutions that there's no counter economic revolutions that have happened. And the way I see it, all revolutions are counter economic in nature. I mean, the the people in the Boston uh, in Boston in the Colonial Revolution throwing uh, tea into the harbor. Um, the Soviet Union, counter-economics was key in uh, overthrowing the Soviet Union. So to me, this has always existed, this um, pressure that the market puts on state regulation. It's just that Konkin just came along recently and put a name to the philosophy and described it uh, in detail. When for that, we have a lot to thank him for. But, you know, I was just telling the podcast, uh, I was on the Friends Against Government podcast yesterday, and I was telling them, it's brand new. This is only 30, 20, 30 years old, this philosophy. I mean, Konkin's only been dead for 15 years. So, you know, usually when people talk about philosophy, they're talking about Socrates or, you know, guys who've been around for thousands of years or even Rothbard, who's relatively new. But Konkin, I mean, this is brand new stuff. I mean, we're, we really are the first generation to have the, uh, this philosophy. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, uh, well, it, Konkin formalized it, right? He put it into words. Uh, but fundamentally, the idea is liberty, right? The idea is voluntary interaction and free exchange. And well, that's just it. Yeah, it's it's just basic. It's just the free market working. Precisely, and as you said, it is a logical conclusion of of having the stance of a freedom of liberty. And agorism, the word, comes from the Greek word agora, which means marketplace. But not just for economic transactions, not just for barter exchange and monetary purchases but also for, for support, right? For supporting your local community, uh, for helping each other out, for, for making sure that, that life is prosperous and meaningful. And That's exactly it. So political change. That's exactly it. And um, speaking of providing for your community, this is a great book by Carl Hess, and that is exactly what he talks about. This is another Agoras classic. Um, you know, it really is all about decentralization and providing market alternatives to state regulation. I think when somebody, uh, all it really takes is for the individual just to the, come to the realization, look, you are free. You all, you are already free. Act like it. You don't need a gang of criminals known as the state to grant you your freedom. You don't need the parasite to tell the host. Now you're free, right? You, you get rid of the parasite. You don't ask the parasite to leave. Absolutely. Uh, nobody is going to give us our liberty. We already have it. We need to assert it. We need to take it. Right. And, you know, if you look at, you know, back to uh, Jane Neal Shulman's book, in, if, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, but one of the things that uh, in that book is that we have the Agorist cadre, who is kind of like, it's kind of like a phase three or four Agorist revolution. And if you think about it, what Ross did, that's exactly what Ross did. As soon as you come to the realization that you're free and you drop out and you act like a sovereign person, you know, not that we're sovereign citizens. I think the sovereign citizen is the is the real hero because those are the guys who are saying, yes, I'm free. I'm going to act like it and I'm going to defend myself. You know, we agorists, we're mostly in the shadows still. We, you know, we operate in the black market, the gray market, but the sovereign citizens are out in the daylight. They're not hiding and they have no problem having to shoot out. I'm not I'm not there yet. But who knows? Well, and fundamentally, you know, it's the sovereign individual. Uh, that is what agorism is about. It's a realization that we are all free. And you are free. He is free. She is free. I am free. And, and now we should act like it. Precisely. Because if we have this realization that we are fundamentally free and, well, divine beings, well, then we shouldn't hurt each other. And not hurting each other should be quite a high, high goal to, to seek to achieve. 
Well, that's one of the things Konkin says. He says violence is never acceptable under any circumstances. Um, you know, obviously, the quote that you read, he mentions how uh, ideally self-defense is localized. Um, property rights are enforced locally. And ideally, that's done by the individual. But um, initiatory violence is never acceptable under any circumstances at all. And I think that really sets us apart from a lot of other sects of libertarianism, particularly the alt-right uh, helicopterians is what I call them, the Pinochet guys. You know, I, I think we have a much better approach. You know, look at Gandhi, for example, and the Salt March. He didn't, Gandhi brought the entire British Empire to their knees and didn't even raise a fist. And he did it all through a counter economic approach. So, I mean, clearly to me, it seems obvious that the, it's the more powerful tool of revolution. Precisely. If, if we come to the realization that we should live free, then we realize, well, that the state is not letting us do that. And there are fundamentally two different types to, to change the situation. If you do not see ignorance as a solution, well, the first would be to violently rebel, uh, to shoot around you and to yell and to shout. And the other option is to walk away. Uh, so but where do you see uh, the differences here? Well, what do you mean between uh, violent revolution and counter-economic revolution? One is peaceful. And that, to me, it's all about violence and uh, coercion. In, a, in an, an agoric revolution, in a counter-economic revolution, like the kind displayed by Shulman or by Gandhi, um, it proves that revolution doesn't always have to be violent. It doesn't always have to involve thousands or tens of thousands or even worse, millions of deaths. Um, you're always going to have the state pushing back. You know, uh, Southerners learned that the hard way and, uh, when, they deal, when they dealt with Lincoln. The state's always going to push back. They're always going to try to hold on to their power. But um, I'm confident that the market will win. You know, I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't, know, I, I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen within our lifetime. But I do believe that eventually the market always wins. Precisely. The market is, is really strong uh, because it's free individuals and free individuals are very powerful. You and know, another thing, too, is um, that's what the socialists do. That's what our enemy, the Marxists do. They're, they're the ones who initiate violence. Let, leave, let them show the world what savages and brutes they are while we are entrepreneurs and we earn money and we innovate. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is look at all the new technology that agorism is behind. Tor, Bitcoin, um, you know, on and on, the 3D printer, aquaponics, and it goes to Airbnb, Uber, the list goes on and on and on. Oh, but absolutely. And and this technology, right, the internet, it's as always, it's it's uh, it's a, a polarity, right? There's good and bad sides to it. Yes, it fosters the surveillance state, but it pushes power to the edges. It decentralizes power. And now the individual has the library of Alexandria on his phone, right? You get all the books that were pretty much ever written, um, not just by the people that are currently living, but historically speaking as well. Yeah, you know, I think um, globalization really, <clears throat> because everybody's so closely tied together nowadays, I think uh, what they're trying to do is, and you see this with the rise of nationalism, is I think people are trying to hold on to their some some sense of identity, some form of self identity, and I think that's behind a lot of the uh, nationalism and whatnot. But yeah, no, you're completely right. Decentralization, you know, it's it's the way it's the way to be and it's the way to go. And I think that, uh, like I said, a lot of it is uh, causing a lot of backlash. But you know, like I said, the state is going to be kicking and screaming. They're not going to just walk away one day and say, "Okay, you win." That's not going to happen. No, once you have the power, you will not easily give it away. You will not easily uh, simply give up. No, uh, they will kick and they will scream and they will shout. But the question is, uh, do they have the power uh, to keep us down any longer? Not forever. <clears throat> I don't think forever. Um, you know, this is another thing I was talking about yesterday was, uh, and Konkin mentions this, I believe, in the book, uh, New Libertarian Manifesto that we're talking about. He talks about, he goes, you know, don't rush it. Don't, don't get ahead of yourselves. Wait for the private defense agencies to pop up. But 
I think we're starting to see that because as more as every newspaper in America is filled with every day there's a headline about some cop uh, you know either murdering somebody or somebody's dog or getting away with you know some terrible crime and that's causing a demand for private defense agencies so we see people like uh, Rayford Davis and um, there's another guy I can't think of his name I met him at Porkfest but there's all these different uh, PDAs private defense agencies popping up we all we all already see it in the court system with arbitration mediation people don't want to use these coercive institutions because they're inefficient and they're not cost effective Absolutely. And uh, I was just here at the Baltic Honey Badger uh, conference, by the way, a bunch of agorists here, Adam Beck, of course, first and foremost. Uh, and guess who defended us there? It was not the police. There were private security guards all over the place, making sure that uh, that all these revolutionaries here uh, right, can be uh, can be safe. And to be honest, there was uh, no violence there. There was no aggression there. We were all peacefully uh, getting together and, and talking and uh, worked quite well. You know, that's like um, <clears throat> all these gun shows in America. With all the mass shootings we have, none of them have ever happened at a gun show, and I, I just can't seem to figure out why. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, it's funny, right, that conference. I was recently at the, uh, the World Blockchain Forum, and I had the opposite experience here in New York. Um, I couldn't find one libertarian. And I was like, I thought I'm at a blockchain conference. I, I mean, I, I kept, I started telling me, I said, we started this, you know? Um, but yeah, they didn't even know what libertarianism was. I was so disappointed. We started Bitcoin. They, they, they got all crazy about this blockchain bingo. Right, right, exactly. That's what I'm saying, you know? Uh, so what are you going to do? Well, but again, right, there is, now with Bitcoin, uh, maybe uh, j just as a, as a side here, um, it is fundamentally 100% pure agorism, right? We're not going to try to change the system from within. Rather, we're going to make a system that is so incredibly useful that everyone is just going to use it. And the fundamental principles of this new technology is liberty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to have some reservations about, uh, about Bitcoin. I don't know if you're familiar with regression theorem. Um, and Mises, Peter Schiff's got a great little book on it. I can't think of the name right now. But um, regression theorem is basically the idea of how money gets started and through a barter economy. And eventually people run into the problem of double wants. So uh, they're looking for a, a commodity to use as a medium of exchange. Well, Bitcoin doesn't really fit the bill in regression theorem. And I was always concerned that there was an issue with that. But recently, I heard Bob Murphy say something interesting. He said something along the lines of, look, if you're concerned that Bitcoin can never be accepted as a money, it already is. It already is being accepted as a money. So that's when I kind of said to myself, oh, all right, well, that makes that makes a lot of sense, you know? Um, absolutely. And, you know, that is like Galileo said, oh, look through the looking glass. It is money. Right, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah exactly. And, and then fundamentally, the regression theory only states that a, a free market economy moves from a pure state of barter to a state of money uh, with a commodity that has use in this uh, barter economy. But once we already have the money, and of course we had money before Bitcoin, the regression theory no longer applies. And even if it would... Bitcoin is useful. Bitcoin can be used for a bunch of other stuff other than e-money. It is an immutable, censorship-resistant, and distributed database that anyone on the entire planet can read and write to. Now, that is unique, and that is quite valuable. Well, I mean, it's the, the proof is in the pudding. The Bitcoin is, what's the price of Bitcoin today? I mean, it's how many thousands times the price of the U.S. dollar? I mean, the market shows shows the results itself. It's, it's working. People prefer... Uh, Bitcoin to using the dollar. If they didn't, the price would be equal. The demand is, is higher, you know. <clears throat> and, and if you look historically, uh, try finding another asset, another money that has outperformed Bitcoin. Good luck. <laughs> there, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I do like gold and silver. Um, I do like gold and silver, but I do think, I think Bitcoin's a little bit easier to use. You know, Peter Schiff's got that He's kind of trying to blend them together, which I'm not really familiar with that. What has he got, gold money or something like that? Um, but yeah, you know, as long as people aren't using fiat, I don't care if you trade uh, gum with each other. 
as long as the demand for Federal Reserve notes is going down, I'm a happy guy. That's the only thing that matters to me. Oh, absolutely. And I love silver. I got a Rothbard <laughs> coin right here, right? Beautiful. Got, got a Mises coin right next to it. Uh, Beautiful. So absolutely. Uh, I, I hodl a lot of gold and a lot of silver. Well, not too much. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but you know, it, it, as you said, Fiat money is the coercive thing. Fiat money is the thing that is backed by violence, that is based on aggression. And that's what I want to cut out of my life. So I no longer hold any fiat. Yeah, it's funny because like you, you said it best right there. It's literally backed by violence. What other information do you need to know about this? This is not something that you should be involved with. It's, it's backed by literally by guns and blood. That is what fiat means. It means uh, in the Latin, let it be. And in a sense of how it is applied, it's, you use this money or we are going to kill you quite literally if you do and not pay your taxes which again is theft and if you do not pay your debt which if it is inflated yeah it is always theft uh, then we are going to apply force and aggression to you that is the threat of violence and ultimately leads to death uh, so i do not want to support such a system no not at all especially when they're using your tax dollars just to uh, buy nicer chains for you and to put your friends and family in chains it doesn't make any sense to me you know you wouldn't want to uh, you wouldn't want to feed a, if you had a, a tumor if you had a, if you had cancer god forbid you wouldn't want to feed the tumor you want to get rid of the tumor so why you know paying taxes and stuff like that makes no sense to me whatsoever it would be like you know if you were a slave and you're helping the slave master weld your chains on doesn't make any sense to me. Precisely, yes. And, uh, you know, we all have a choice in this. And we all have the opportunity to decide on every single economic transaction what currency we want to use, what money we want to support. And uh, do you see that, uh, of course, money is not everything, right? Uh, so do you see other uh, choices that we humans have in everyday transactions? Well, like I said, I mean, as long as you're not using fiat, you know, there's you can use any commodity you want, really. I think obviously people are going to prefer gold and silver and Bitcoin and things that they can that the, where the value is uh, stable and dependable. And I think you'll, you'll see that more and more as um, Bitcoin matures, that price will get I think that price will stabilize and it'll become more and more accepted. Um, there's already some great companies out there like Beam, for example, is one of them. Uh, there's a couple more. I can't think of the name right now. But when you go check out and you just, you know, you use Apple Pay or you just, you know, use your card real quick, you just use the chip. Uh, it's going to be like that in the future with Bitcoin, but just even quicker. I really believe that. Um, and, you know, just to touch on something you said earlier about fiat, uh, you guys in Germany had a great example of, of that, um, of the Weimar in, in, the, in Weimar in Germany. Um, and that's, that's the road that we're all headed down now. We're, we all got on that boat. All precisely. And, and there's this great book, When Money Dies. And that is literally what is going to happen. You have to push all this dirty and worthless fiat paper money down the gutter because it's worth shit, quite literally. Right. You know, and that's the thing. Um, <clears throat> if somebody was going to write a contract with you and you had two contenders to write this contract and you had one person who's going to pay you in fiat and the other person is going to pay you in Bitcoin, even if you're the you know the most status person in the world, you'd have to be nuts not to choose the Bitcoin. You know what I mean? That is actually brings brings us to quite an interesting topic, which is a, a economic phenomena, which is Gresham's law. So if you hold in your one hand fiat money, worthless pieces of paper backed by violence, on the other hand, you hold precious gold or precious satoshis. And now you want to make an economic transaction and buy a coffee. Well, which do you want to get rid of first, the precious Bitcoin or the worthless piece of paper? Well, of course, you're going to throw away your, your fiat as fast as possible, and you're going to huddle your stack of Bitcoin for as long as possible, because this, this is good money. This is sound money. Well, I think that kind of had a lot to do with uh, last year, that, that jump up to 20 grand. I think that had a lot to do with that. Everybody was holding on to it because it was this, nobody knew uh, what the limits were. I still think it's going to go... Uh, to the moon, you know, I think I'm, I'm still ready for Lambos and, and moon. Um, that's just the way I see it. Um, I really, I think it was, I'm trying to think, I think it was Wednesday, Wednesday Cesares from Zappo. He said a million dollars and he's a, a very intelligent person. Um, there's a lot of people who think uh, John McAfee says he's going to eat his dick if it doesn't hit uh, 50 grand on Christmas. So, 
in a worst case scenario, even if we don't have the 50 grand in our pocket, we can at least all watch that together. <laughs> well, I'm quite curious what Joe McAfee is gonna gonna put up uh, with that, because uh, his videos are, are quite hilarious, actually. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm afraid to see. Because <laughs> he's gonna do it. I don't know. He's thick enough to do it. Well, but probably he's gonna make like a, a chocolate version of his own day <laughs> and deliciously eat it on camera. Most likely. Well, that would be a little bit more PG, so. <laughs> well, well, you never know. Uh, so let's get surprised. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, you know, you brought you brought up uh, the um, innovation briefly that, that is happening in Bitcoin and, and the you know immense innovation that we see, for example, with the Lightning Network, which quite literally gives you the option of, of hundreds of thousands of payments every second at barely any cost, or you can even have it completely cheap if you have a direct payment channel. And this, like the Lightning Network, was just one little tiny thing in the entire Bitcoin market. There's so much more innovation. Why do we not see this innovation in, in fiat money? Well, that's just it. I mean, look at all of the all of the all of these old legacy markets that are controlled by the state. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the uh, educational market. Look at these schools. They haven't changed in like 150 years. I mean, the, the concept that you go to the schoolhouse and you sit in front of the blackboard and a teacher lectures to you and you take notes, that's how kids have went to school for, you know, what, 200 years, 150 years in this country? Um, there's no innovation. There's no change. Now, compare that to your cell phone or your, or your computer or your television or your car. Anything that's market-driven, the innovation ha happens at such a, a faster rate. It's incredible because the market has no incentive to innovate. Why would they change when they're guaranteed payment? Why would, what, what uh, incentive, what impetus do they have to get better if they're guaranteed payment? I, I, would, I would provide a shittier product if I knew my customers would still, uh, you know, still, still pay me. Who wouldn't? Then you're making more money. Oh, absolutely, right? All these incentives are completely obliterated because you no longer have to make a good product doesn't matter. You force people to buy it. <laughs> so you quite literally can can you know, produce a piece of shit. And Anything if you that the state found you to buy is like that. Um, you know, health insurance is another good example. It's it's awful. Health insurance is terrible. So, you know, it, it's just another good example of one of these old uh, well now it's, I guess it's a new legacy market that the state is creating in healthcare and you know it's experiencing all the problems that we had come to expect shortages which result in high prices and inefficiencies and you know the sad thing is that we pay the price but again you're starting to see a lot of uh counter economics in the healthcare market now we have doctors here who uh only take cash and they work under the table i don't know i mean i'm assuming they're uh, somewhat under the table but they only take cash and it's kind of like a, a pay per you know whatever operation you need. And there have been other really quite nice innovations on the free market on how to provide healthcare. For example, I read that in Japan, hist historically, there was a system that you do not pay for a doctor visit. Rather, you pay if you do not have to visit the doctor. Therefore, the doctor gets paid when you're healthy and you do not need him. But then when you need him, when you're desperate, He's actually going to take good care of you and try to get you as soon as possible on your feet. I'm not saying that this is perfect, but I'm saying that we should allow such innovations. Oh, of course, definitely. You know, anything that's voluntary, I'm I'm on board with. I, you know, I could care as long as you're doing something voluntarily. I don't care what you do. Um, I probably would prefer a system a little bit more um, based on market incentive. But like I said, you know, whatever floats your boat. Exactly. And then, you know, another uh, classical argument is the roads. Who's going to build the roads? Well, I'm asking, who's building them right now? Because guess what? You know how many people are dying on the roads every single day? <laughs> it's mass murder. Who owns these roads? Who's built them? What is going on here? Why do we tolerate this? Have you read um, The Privatization of Roads and Highways by Walter Block? I have, and you have an absolute amazing conversation with Walter on, on your uh, the, the Agora podcast. So, guys, check that out. Yeah, um, he, uh, he's got the privatization series, and he's got three books, um, Privatization of Roads and Highways, 
water capitalism and space capitalism. And I, I love all of them. Um, basically, the only thing he's really doing is applying the homesteading principle to every different realm that he could think of. But his thoughts are just, he comes up with the most genius arguments. Um, one of the things he says about the roads is like he calculates um, like how much inefficiency you can find in a statist market versus how much inefficiency in a free market. And he's able to come up, come up with a number of traffic deaths that wouldn't, wouldn't be in a, in a market-based uh, transportation sector. So I think it's something like, it's over 30,000. Don't quote me on this number. I'm pretty sure it's like 30,000 or more people die every year because the state uh, owns the roads. So to me, this is like, this is like a, a travesty. This is a tragedy, you know, and for, for people to defend this, I mean, it's almost like you're defending like, uh, you know, a mass murder or a genocide or something like that. Exactly. And, you know, we're not saying that if, if the roads would be provided voluntarily that nobody would die on, on the roads. Oh, no, it's, it's dangerous. Absolutely. But what we're saying is that if so many people are dying, well, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we should, we should try something different. And fundamentally, if you have a state market, there are no other options. You are being forced to do this and you're being punished if you try to innovate and do something differently. Also, I think another big part of the whole roads thing is I really think the roads are the the crux to uh, hanging on the state hanging on to its power because if the states were if the roads were private, you wouldn't be able to have cops hiding behind trees with their little laser gun trying to find out how fast you're going and uh, set up checkpoints for seat belts and stuff like that. That's not going to happen on a private road. Uh, you know, uh, private road providers would develop a series of best practices and that would kind of become the uh, voluntarily accepted law of the land. You know what I mean? Precisely. And, you know, we, we never know exactly what these entrepreneurs are going to do because they are free individuals, right? They have their own free will. And then here, you know, the question is, what are the incentives? What is the game theory behind it? What are, what are the economic rational uh, opinions? And they're just like any other product or service. They want to satisfy the consumers. That's what entrepreneurs do. Allocate resources in an uncertain future to provide for their consumers the most efficient, most productive, most valuable goods. Well, that's just it. Um, you know, going back to the roads, why would you use road company A that has, you know, 30,000 deaths a year or you could use road company B where the guy's innovating and maybe, who knows, maybe he's set up bumpers along the side so you can crash into the sides. Maybe he, it's, you know, like bumper cars with the pole hanging up. Maybe we'd have flying cars by now. We don't know because we're not the entrepreneurs in that market because the, the state doesn't allow it. You can't be an entrepreneur in this market. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in the chat, we have my boat plans <laughs> saying that we should all travel by boat. Well, but the problem is, who owns the water? That's that's the second book in um, the privatization series. And that's another one where he makes some incredible arguments. Um, something like along the lines of, and I'm gonna, I'm, I hope I don't screw it up, but it's early on in the book. He says something like, look at the amount of uh, GDP derived, and it's all from the land. And the amount of uh, surface area that the land takes up is like so small compared to the oceans. Imagine what the GDP could be if we privatize the oceans. Um, there's a good example in, I believe it's off the coast of Canada, where there's like, there was this uh, reef where it was a great spot to go fishing. So all the fishing companies were there every day and eventually the fish were gone. Well, uh, I believe that the, the government of Canada eventually said, all right, screw it, just privatize it. And uh, somebody bought or leased the area in the ocean with this reef and this person has an incentive now to make sure that it's always stocked with fish, that it's a healthy uh, environment, it's not polluted. If you spill oil on this guy's reef, he's gonna sue you. So now the numbers have returned, everything's healthier. Um, you see a, another example of this is with the elephants in uh, Africa. They do the same thing. Um, the white rhinos, they were almost extinct. And uh, once certain governments started to allow people to hunt them and buy permits for admittedly exorbitant amounts of money, but what they were able to do is they were able to take this money and use it to better the community 
not only that, but now farmers and ranchers were incentivized to keep white rhinos on their land and breed them. So then the numbers uh, return to healthy, healthy levels. It's just, it's just basic economics, but the state doesn't care because they're violent psychopaths. Precisely. And, you know, again, it's incentives. It's game theory. If you but don't forget, something... when it comes time to vote, they're going to they're gonna pretend like they care, which, which is, to me, this is like, you know, it's like hilarious how they spend, when, as soon as they get into office, they spend all this time killing and destroying, and then as soon as it comes time to vote, it's like, look at all the nice things that I've done for you. What would you guys do without me? You know, it's just, it's, it's insane. It's insane. If, if somehow the government would get the monopoly, the, the, if they could exclude other entrepreneurs on teaching children how to walk, after one generation, we would all think that we could not walk without the state. Yeah, yeah. And you'd have, you'd have groups of Democrats protesting that, you know, you can't take away the laws to uh, walk. And, you know, it, it's, it's a sad reality that the, that the public is in today. It really is. Well, yeah. but, you know, that's, that's, that's the common result that you'd expect after decades and decades of public schooling. You, you know, it, it took what, you know, how many, we were just talking about the schooling system, how many decades did it take to achieve this effect where you basically have a population of sheep now, uh, slaves who are blind. They worked really hard to achieve that effect. They put a lot of money and invested a lot of time and effort into that. So, you know, now they're reaping the rewards. Exactly, exactly. And uh, this has been a multi-generational um, you know, event and effort. And um, in order to you know, make the public realize or, or support them in the realization of this fact, this will, again, take several generations. Uh, so, you know, what are your thoughts on, on how you can, quote unquote, de-brainwash all these sheeples? I think a lot of it has to do with um, institutions like Mises and Fee, Abbeville, a lot of um, educators. There's a lot. There's a role for educators, guys like Murray Rothbard and Tom Woods. Um, this is another thing I was talking about on Fagcast yesterday. These guys are not gonna. You're not gonna see Tom Woods out in the street uh, pimping hoes or running guns or selling dope. But you know these people, they're they're better inclined to do things like educate others, um, like you and I, about these things. So then we can go out and you know, start to recruit, um, which by the way, you know, another thing Conkin mentions is we're really supposed to recruit from the more radical uh, group of anarchists. So I think, you know, as far as education goes, that's kind of like a, an entry level uh, thing. As far as us agorists go, we're looking for the people who already know uh, that taxation is theft. Well, we don't want to have to, if you don't, if you don't think taxation is theft, you're not ready for agorism yet. Precisely. And, you know, that's something that I talk a lot about the show, the Tribune. First, you have to acquire information so that you have the knowledge. Then you have to understand this information, which is an internal process. And then you have to apply this understood knowledge by acting in accordance with your thoughts and your emotions and your actions. And that is fundamentally then what agorism is all about. Once you have all the information about liberty, once you have understood what liberty actually means, and then what are you going to do? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to act blindly and continue on your path of self-destruction? Or are you going to act in accordance to liberty? And that is what agorism is. You know, and the, the thing is, too, going back to education, is this, if you think about it, really, the only thing the public schools do is indoctrinate your child they don't there really is no uh learning no true learning going on between uh economics or mathematics um even look at the history classes are the worst what they i don't know what version of history they're teaching but it certainly isn't a, an accurate version of history so this is why i think and i think Conkin said it too there's really three aspects to agorism there's logic counter economics and revisionist uh, history and that's what I try to focus the Agora podcast on. And I think a huge part of that, really an enormous part of that, is the revisionist history because uh, it's, it's slave building. It's slave building, turning presidents into godheads and, you know, talking about, you know, you got to love the troops and support, support the troops no matter what they do and back the blue and all this crap you see. This is, these are, 
How about the uh, military recruiters in schools? I mean, we we're supposed to have laws against slave catching. They really are. It's one of the most dangerous institutions that you could be a part of are the public schools. Absolutely. And now, you know, there has been a monopoly, the exclusion of new market participants in education for a long time. And uh, maybe could you go a bit more into them, how we can break such monopolies, how we well, can make new yeah. entrepreneurs enter the market? Well, it's funny you say that because um, I don't know where you are, but here um, we have this, uh, the Republicans, they're pushed for these, these charter schools, which is like, it works, you know, it's different area by area, but basically the idea is that you're, the tax money you pay for the schools, you get that back in the, in the form of like tuition at a private school. But um, this is still theft. It's still based on taxation. So it's like, there's such slime balls that they're like, oh, look, don't worry. We understand, you know, our schools are bad. We're going to help you out. We're going to give you a privatized alternative, but it's going to be with stolen money. So no matter what they do, they're, they're not going to give us a break. And, you know, as far as market alternatives go, the only option really is homeschooling. Unless you're going to go for a completely privatized, unless you can find a private school that uh, has you the same values uh, that you want your kids to learn, stuff like that. You know, there's a great book um, that I, I people see me show it on Twitter all the time. Uh, show it on Twitter all the time. The School Revolution by Ron Paul, and he does a great job um, breaking down the state's indoctrination camps. Also, Rothbard's got a, a quick little book called Education Free and Compulsory, which is available free at Mises. And Tom Woods, um, another free book. Um, I think that one's called Education Without the State. All these are great books. All these are great books. Um, and I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'm putting together an episode of the Agora on homeschooling, and those are some of the main sources that I'll be using. So, and you know, these books are just liberty applied to education, right? It is fundamentally based in, in the principle of free interaction that you are a sovereign individual and that you, you should not be forced to quote unquote learn. Because if it is not voluntary, well, guess what? Then you're not going to learn jack shit. And, you know, it's not even, it's like I said, it's not even learning. It's you're learning how to be a slave. You're learning how, how, your how to make your chains feel comfortable. Um, it's all nonsense. It's all, I mean, if you could, after somebody graduates from school, from a public school, they have to go through a, a, a de-learning process where they can clear all that garbage out of their heads and then start reading guys like Rothbard and Mises and Ralph Rico and Sam Konkin and Carl Hess. It's only after you get uh, all this crap out of your head about you know the Civil War and thank God Teddy Roosevelt made national parks and oh we had to be in World War One and Two and you know it's just all uh, it's all designed to assist the parasite in its activity. And I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in removing the parasite. Well, but wouldn't you say that because we were in World War One and World War II, you know, a bunch of stuff blew up and we had to rebuild it. And that rebuilding process brought us so much prosperity. Right, right. Like the like the Keynesians or the Kruger Knights would say, you know, it's just the most ridiculous thing in the world. It's, you know, if you want to if you want to keep yourself busy, just break your window and sweep up your glass and just continue this process over and over and over again in a never ending cycle of just liberal bullshit that's really all it is oh yeah and then at least we have jobs right because that's what it's all about jobs ridiculous ridiculous <laughs> actually have you read um i just actually got uh that contra krugman book that's another great podcast and i just got the book now they have um, a book i didn't know that the podcast is great just put it out and i just started and it's great it really is a very good book I guess so, the uh, audio book. So th this podcast is really something that uh, you might want to look into if you want to get educated on uh, on really both the uh, as well the uh, the statist arguments, right? They're going to go deep into uh, what uh, Krugman or what well, Krugman especially, but then also what uh, Keynes said, and they are going to dissect um, Murphy and Woods are going to dissect. Uh, one article of Krugman um, in a really quite uh, funny way. Uh, so you learn a lot by refuting these nonsensical arguments. 
And in the book, he goes through uh, like subject by subject, like the minimum wage and the Great Depression, and he goes, you know, one by one. So it's a really great book if you want to learn how to refute um, the Keynesians and the the Krugmans and the New York Times uh, whack jobs, you know. So why do you think is that these statist economists are so prevalent, and why do they have so such a big voice? Well, it's like, you know, they're, they're, these are what uh, I think Tom DiLorenzo calls them court historians. It's the same thing, but in economics, they're just people who uh, serve to reinforce the state's uh, bullshit. They're just here to uh, drive it down your throat. Sometimes I wonder if they even believe the crap that they spew. Like, a good example is that broken windows uh, argument. Can they actually, I mean, really, do you, I mean, do they really believe this? I mean, how stupid can you be? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I don't want to sound like a dick, but I mean, come on. It's just common sense as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's the thing with common sense, right? It <laughs> should right. be common sense, but unfortunately, it is no longer common sense. And that shows the degradation of, of society and knowledge. Like, you don't need a PhD in economics to see that this doesn't work. You just need uh, to be a human being with a, a basic rational faculty. Yeah, and uh, of course, that is something that is not being taught, rationality. Well, not only that, but they're also teaching dependency in the indoctrination camps. So when it comes, comes time to vote, that's why you see uh, all these young people nowadays, they're so uh, socialist and they, they just want to vote. You know, if you don't give them free health care, then you're, you're an evil person. If you don't, if you don't support um, paid maternity leave or... Uh, I saw another one the other day. It was like paid preschool or something like that. And it does, it's just insane. But eventually, hey, look, there's another way to look at that is let them spin out of control. Let them uh, make poor decisions because then it's just going to fall apart quicker. And that means that people are going to look for free market alternatives uh, sooner than, than later. Oh, yeah. And, and this dependency is fundamentally the goal of, of, what, of what this data philosophy is all about. You want, or you as a statist politician, you want to be dependent upon because then you can retain your power. Then you have a reason to exist because people want that you govern them, that you control them. Well, that's just it. You know, you have the people on the right, the right wing politicians who are, don't worry, I'm going to protect your Medicare and I'm going to make sure we bomb everybody for you. And then you have people on the left who look, you're going to get free health care and free whatever. You know, to me, it's like we're all, we're all, uh, this is an analogy I used yesterday too. It's like sometimes I feel like we're all monkeys in the zoo and half the monkeys are saying he should be the slave master. And the other half of the monkeys are saying, no, he should be the slave master. And I'm just over here like, look, I'm, I'm trying to get back to the jungle. I want back in the Congo. I don't want to pick a slave master or a zookeeper. I want out. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, right. there should always be a way out. Right? And again, that is what agorism is, walking away, getting a way out, making, creating a way out. Because only with free exchange can you actually create something. Fall out, drop out, tune out, fall out of these uh, state institutions. You don't need them. If, you, if, you, if there is an alternative, take it. Sometimes, of course, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. So you, know, you, you have no choice but to do business with the state. Um, you know, a good example of that is when we do drive on the roads, we don't have a choice. We can't, if we drive on the grass, then they're going to shoot us and we're probably going to do property damage. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's probably what they care most about. Yeah, right, right. And so, you know, what are the different strategies of opting out? Well, um, you know, Per Byland has a great um, article. Um, I believe it's on lourockwell.com called strategies for forcing the state back or something along the something to the effect of that and i'm going to have him on the agora and uh, we're going to talk about the horizontal and vertical strategies that he mentions um he's got some great work on this yeah there you go that's it and that's actually how i came across this book by carl hess because that's he talks about that um in the, when he speaks about horizontal strategies and carl hess was big on um Kind of like, in other words, what he would he would uh, he did a, a experiment in the Adams Morgan section of Washington D.C. where he tried to make a community um, self reliant, 
And his idea was, look, if we can uh, organize ourselves at the community level, we can ignore the state and federal government. So for a while, he was uh, using aquaponics and hydroponics to grow fish and vegetables, and he was feeding the whole local area. And, um, you know, it could be, the point is, you don't have to be like a Ross Ulbricht or a Cody Wilson. Nobody is going to, not many of us have the, the gusto to sacrifice, to make such a huge sacrifice for everyone else. But there are small things you could do. Use Bitcoin, use aquaponics, learn 3D printing. Use Uber, use Lyft and Airbnb. If you if you don't have to stay in a hotel, don't because that's one less dollar in the tax collection, and one less dollar for the the state has is one less dollar they can use to oppress you and your family. Absolutely, and you bring up Ross Ulbricht, no doubt, free Ross, no victim, no crime, and also the nonsense propaganda going on with Cody Wilson and that entire situation. Is that and ridiculous or what? It's crazy. It makes me sick. Yeah, it really is. It is disgusting and a tragedy, a human tragedy. Uh, and I, I would like to point out just one more agorist, uh, maybe the greatest agorist and cypherpunk that has ever existed, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Because not only was he, did he have such a fundamental grasp of counter economics and monetary theory and cypherpunk movement, cryptography, mathematics, game theory, incentives, that he made the system that will help us, a tool that will help us to retain ownership over our financial sovereignty. And he, the cool thing is that Satoshi knew that being such a radical agorist put a huge target on his back. And so he combined the philosophy of agorism with the philosophy of cypherpunk movement that he used anonymity online in cyberspace, that he used PGP encryption, that he created a anonymity, a, a pseudonym, a, a thing, uh, a, a, a digital identity. Uh, so how do you think can we can we combine agorism and cypherpunk? Well, I, I definitely think you're right. Um, <clears throat> you definitely make a good point about how he uh, stayed in the shadows and was able to protect himself like that. Um, you know, Ross and Cody were more public, so uh, the state put a target on their back much sooner. But if Satoshi was uh, in the public eye, I don't doubt for one second he would be locked up right now. They would never allow such um, such strong competition to the Federal Reserve notes. Um, you know, as far as like cypherpunks go, I don't really know. Um, I just actually, when I talked about sci-fi, I was reading uh, Snow Crash, which is a, really a staple of the cyberpunk movement. And uh, L. Neil Smith, is an excellent, excellent um, libertarian. He's also friends with Jeff Bezos. But as far as like how to combine cyberpunk with libertarianism and agorism, I don't really know. I don't really have a good answer for you on that one. Well, I, I don't think that you really do need to like specifically combine them because they are kind of one and the same thing, right? Both assert individual sovereignty, one over the marketplace, the other over your privacy and, and sovereignty in cyberspace. And so it is, again, the same philosophy, the same fundamental building block of liberty just apply to different concepts. Well, that's just that, you know, it all depends on how you define the terms, right? like everything else. Oh, absolutely. And I, I do believe, however, that for us agorists, uh, the tools that were created by these cypherpunks, for example, right, Adam Beck, who was uh, at the, uh, if I can find it again, at the Baltic Honey Badger Conference, he uh, built, uh, gave us so much, uh, uh, so many tools to defend ourselves in cyberspace. And using these tools correctly gives us the opportunity of engaging in free and voluntary exchange in all walks of life. And we see that with stuff like the Silk Road, which is beautiful. Um, absolutely. The only thing I would say is it doesn't, agorism doesn't require technology. It's, it's best off when you do mix it with technology. But, um, you know, look at guys like Lavoy Finicum, um, the rancher out west, who uh, he was as simple as him for joining the militia and keeping the federal government. He was occupying the Malhor wild, uh, Wildlife Refuge. That's a good example of agorism as far as I'm concerned, because he was taking state property and putting it into private hands. Now, uh, Erwin Schiff is another example. He didn't uh, innovate anything. He just said, that's it. I'm done. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm not going to be uh, extorted by you guys anymore. And for that, they killed him.
Absolutely. Uh, that's that's what government really specializes in. <laughs> that's their niche, killing stuff. But, you know, like you said, though, it is best when it is. I think it's most efficient when agorism meets technology. Um, you know, look at the ghost gunner. The ghost gunner, it, it did more for to protect our gun rights than every dollar ever donated to the NRA, every vote ever cast for a right wing politician. Um, and the same thing goes with Bitcoin. Um, we don't if you, if you don't like inflation then don't let your currency be inflated. Use Bitcoin. Like we have the tools. If you don't like, uh, if you don't like the government listening and or reading your your uh, browser history, use Tor. I mean, there's all different types of technological solutions to uh, state regulations. So you're you're definitely right. I I, I do agree with you. Oh, precisely. And and this, you know, the Ghost Gunner project um, is again agorism applied. Right. It is something that. Uh, that fundamentally, you know, just gives you the the tools to do anything that's peaceful. And again, that is agorism. Well, agorism is action, right? That's what Konkin always said. Um, you know, the you, to to be an agorist, you have to act. You can't be an agorist in theory. It does require some form of action. Absolutely. And uh, you know this action is 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 so important because again it is the conclusion of the trivia. This is when your your thoughts and your emotions and your actions are aligned according to natural law principles. Uh, so you know maybe uh, how would how how would you see the the integration of uh, this holistic uh, understanding and and how does a holistic understanding of liberty differ from a, a, a decompartmentalized understanding? Well, you know, I think that a lot of this goes back to um, minarchist. This harkens back to the whole minarchist versus anarchist debate. Uh, you know, I have a good article on my blog called uh, Against the Partyarchy, and I go into this a lot. I don't think that liberty, I'm not sure that it can be compartmentalized. I'm not sure that we can say, okay, we're free in this, a couple uh, respects, but we're still slaves in, you know, these respects. All right, yeah, I have a gun and I, I open carry, but um, I still pay my taxes. I'm still uh, being extorted by the state for uh, property taxes or whatever the case may be. I think you're either free or you're not. You're a slave or you're not. Now, like I said, um, you know, a lot of times it's harder to avoid doing business with the state. But um, if you don't have to, don't. Don't. If you, you don't have to compartmentalize it, don't. Yeah, there you go. Exactly, right? It, it, it is if you live in accordance with your thoughts, emotions, and actions, then this will fundamentally you know, bring liberty because that is when you can manifest the greatest amount of change in society and, and in this in this world. So, you know, what do you think? What what actions are required? Uh, and uh, can we even say that there are actions it's necessary? It's as simple as this. You just got to snap your fingers. That's it. That's it. And now you're free. Look, we all know that we're free. Everybody who's uh, tuning into your show, they probably understand the concept of sovereignty. They probably know that the state is a parasite. But maybe some of them, who knows, maybe uh, the less radicalized uh, of your listeners or whoever's listening to this, maybe they don't get that yet. But it's as simple as just telling yourself, I'm free now. And that's it. And now I... The parasite's gone. The state is nothing more than a gang. That's it. They're just the most successful gang uh, around. They're the mafia that outcompeted the Gambinos and the rest of them. So just drop out. Just just stop telling yourself that you're a slave. Ignore them. If you can ignore a law, ignore it and don't pay attention to it. Obviously, I'm not saying don't be stupid. Don't sacrifice yourself um, unnecessarily or don't sacrifice yourself uh early you know maybe you should wait if you have um you know big counter economic plans maybe you should wait for a private defense agency who knows or that would be a great counter economic thing to start right there is a private defense agency oh yes absolutely and one of my favorite quotes from rothbard is government is a gang of thieves writ large and yeah fundamentally that's yeah, that's how competed their competition they i mean literally if you think about it what does the gang do they go around and they look for other gangs and they try to uh use violence to
put them out of business and take their territory. Well, what was the state's relationship with uh, the Gambinos, right? I'm here in New York. So when I was a kid, we had like John Gotti and that was a big thing in New York City. All they did was just drive them out of business the same way that Amazon has, is driving Walmart out of business. It's the same thing. They're just, they're just out competing, but they're using violence to do it. They're no different than, than the mafia, if you think about it. In fact, the mafia was actually much more benevolent. Um, you know, with the lottery, for example, I think it was, I don't know if it was uh, Meyer Lansky or one of those old school uh, mafios guys, they were given out like, you know, don't quote me on the number, but the amount of the winnings that you were able to keep was so much higher than what the state allows you to keep. And the whole justification for nationalizing the lottery was that, oh, it's a scam. You're getting robbed. You're getting ripped off. You have to let us, the, the state, do it. We'll make sure you don't get screwed. And they ended up doing it worse than, uh, than the mafia did, you know? Well, because a, a mafia fundamentally still has you no know, market forces applied to it. There are other mafias, right? There, there is comp yeah. competition. There is exactly. energy between, between mafias. Um, you know, in the, in the book Snow Crash, that's one of the things I mentioned on, I did an episode on sci-fi books. And one of the things I talked about was the book Snow Crash. I love in that book how you start to see when the government goes away, how the mafia um, and the Colombian cartels, they all of a sudden they're subject to market accountability. So you see how they behave in a much more uh, responsible way than the state does. So they like, you know, it, it's pretty funny to come up with like Colombia is what they call it. And that's another good book, Uncle Enzo's Pizza or something like that. I definitely recommend that book too to anybody who's interested in it. There, there are many, many book recommendations, right? And there's lots of information to read. But again, like that's something that I always uh, find a, a, a different nuance. When is it enough to, uh, whenever we reach a state of having acquired enough knowledge, enough information, uh, and you know, having understood it, and when do we have to say, okay, we know all this shit, now we have to go out and do it. Is there a fundamental line? Can we ever stop acquiring information? Well, I think it's a spectrum. I think it's it's subjective to the individual. Um, and, you know, I think Konkin talks about this too. Uh, there's a spectrum of agorism. Maybe you don't wear your seatbelt and that's all you do. You're, uh, you're, when you're not wearing your seatbelt and you're supposed to be, you're behaving like an agorist. And then there's some people like Cody Wilson and Ross Ulbricht who just throw grenades into the system. You know what I mean? And that's, uh, it's different for everybody. You should do what you feel comfortable with. Don't get it over your head. Don't do something stupid. You don't want to uh, sacrifice, you know, um, sacrifice yourself over a small battle. But do whatever it is that you can. Uh, any any routine part of your life that you do on a daily basis that you can remove the state from, do it. Do it. It's as simple as that. Just drop out of the state institutions. Just remove yourself. Good points, and this is fundamentally well, com completely individualistic, right? And uh, maybe to, to t uh, swing swing a bit around, and we've we've uh, we got to talk about your podcast, The Accord, which is really, really, really great. And you know, in these in, in the early shows, I think the first six episodes or so, you do talk a lot about um, geopolitics, yeah. and, and maybe could you just you know elaborate a bit on on why geopolitics is so interesting? Right. Well, look, I think that um, particularly in the um, parasitical institutions like the State Department and um, a lot of these, like the diplomats in, in, in all around the world, not just America, in every country, they're using these old theories from uh, geopolitical uh, thinkers like Alfred Thayer Mahan and Alfred McKinder. Um, and Nicholas Spikeman, and these theories are completely outdated. They don't provide any emphasis on. Uh, they, there's no. They're so deterministic that there's no room for individual action. And we know, as Austrians, as libertarians, that it's really the individual that acts. You know, right? It's it's the individuals that act subjectively. States don't. They can't imitate a market. They can't act um, in an economic way. So. For example, I have, I have an uh, episode on the South China Sea where we talk about um, how the American government has derailed 
by applying the theories of Alfred Mahan uh, and how, you know, one of the things he said was you want to extend sea power and the government is really doing that and it's obvious in the South China Sea and that is cr quickly creating a very dangerous situation. So I figured in making these episodes, hey, look, maybe I can start to get the word out that uh, these aren't the right, this isn't the right way to go about it. And I kind of, I, especially in that episode, I try to juxtapose um, the status theorists with Wa uh, Walter Block's book, Water Capitalism, because he mentions the South China Sea. And one of the things he says that I love is, look, if Vietnam and China and America get into a three-way battle over you know, uh, the sea, then lots and lots of people are going to die. But if two entrepreneurs truly cannot resolve their differences, which is unlikely, but if they truly can't do it, Worst case scenario, they're only going to fight amongst themselves. So you're going to minimize the amount of deaths in a private market. That's how a, a market, uh, a free market, retains efficiency and resourcefulness. Yes, exactly. And uh, there are always, you know, limits on what a nation state uh, can use in their means of production based on the natural resources that are in the area that this nation state is is located in. Uh, so where do you see the the nuances of, of using these natural resources? Well, that's the whole thing. They're not the state's resources to be uh, distributed in the first place. It's all up to the entrepreneurs and the markets to allocate resources. Um, you know, for example, uh, Russia doesn't have a port, right? So they, they have no warm water port. And that's one of the things I mentioned is that this frustration for them has really driven a lot of their uh, hostility. At least this is according to the geograph uh, geopolitical thinkers. Now, if there was a market involved, if there wasn't a state, right, then Russia would have a much easier access to the waterways because people want to trade. They want to reach the Russian markets. And all this would make for a much more peaceful world. You wouldn't have things like... Uh, you know, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan and, uh, you know, a lot of the East-West battles um, over the years, you know, the Cold War and stuff like that. A lot of that wouldn't have happened if we had a, a free market, particularly in, in you know, private property. And, you know, that is something that was especially prevalent with the Great War, uh, which was the name of the First World War, well, before we had the Second. Doesn't mean it doesn't make any sense to call something the first if there's not a second, so was called right, the Great right. War, precisely because it, uh, the governments figured out that they can now finance war with fiat money, right? And this gave them a lot of more and additional resources. Yeah, that was um, that was a particularly ugly episode in human history. Um, you know, Churchill was a, a, I think we spoke a little bit before we went on, how Churchill was really a monster, and he had a lot to do with creating World War I, but... You know, if you look in the history books, you don't learn this stuff. And World War I led to World War II. And World War II led to the Cold War and the Middle East problems that we have. So if we got rid of, uh, if we got rid of a lot of this stuff, we wouldn't have to deal with it. You know, the state really is a cancer that in the, if you can excise the tumor, you should. Oh, yes, absolutely. And... Uh, you know that's that's the thing. Even even if private parties would wage war against each other, they are limited, right? Because they cannot steal stuff, at least not legally, and uh, the state can't do so legally. And uh, this this means that there are much more restrictions on waging war for private individuals than for uh, states. Oh, absolutely. And I don't. I'm not even entirely convinced. You know, imagine what it would take for a private defense agency to actually use violence. I mean, it really would be only as a super last resort. They would never use violence if they didn't have to, because you know, violence is costly. It's co it's, it's you're not going to gain customers if they see that you're uh, you have a violent you're predisposed to being violent. They don't people aren't going to want that. They're going to want a, a PDA who is able to resolve situations peacefully. And because there is no individual private property, there is no free exchange. Because there is no free exchange, there are no prices. Because there are no prices, these states cannot allocate resources. So not only are states wasting resources,
but they use this wasteful resource allocation to reach a huge amount of havoc, right? They want to destroy as much as they can, and they do it really, really inefficiently. So this is this is bad on two sides. I mean, going back to the South China Sea for a second, uh, you know, you have the Vietnamese who depend on the South China Sea to just to, to for subsistence, um, fishing and you know everything. And the same thing with all of the surrounding nations, um, Brunei, Philippines. I mean, there's a whole host of them. Now, right now, we're in a situation where they are competing with one another with militarily. But if we had a, a different situation based on free market economics, where they're competing with one another um, based on their dollar, then those resources would be driven up in price, which would discourage people from buying them and there would be more of them. So you wouldn't have things like overfishing, pollution. Um, you know, the other thing too is in that area particularly, they think there's a lot of oil. And there, that's, I think that has a lot to do with the uh, military jousting you see in that area. But if it was all privatized, it would be, all right, well, who's the highest bidder? Who's, who's gonna spend the most? Who wants it the most? Exactly, as it should be, right? Free individuals uh, allocating these resources in such a way that uh, they are not wasteful. Right? Um, and, you know, we talked now about, about geopolitics a bit, but of course, all, a, a huge portion of all these theories have been made while or at a stage where we only had meat space, right? There was only meat space around, so all these theories only talked about meat space. Well, now we have cyberspace. And how does geopolitics change when we have cyberspace? You know, that's a great question. Um, that's super interesting. I did an episode on um, astropolitics, and a lot of that has to do with the satellites that are in orbit. And um, the internet, radio, a lot of radio, television, stuff like that is dependent on satellites who, which are in geostationary orbit. And these... Um, Geostationary orbit is orbit over the equator um, in a geosynchronous level. So in other words, they can basically, when the Earth moves, they're moving with the Earth, so they can stare at a given area continuously. And a lot of the internet connections and DirecTV and SiriusXM, this all comes from these satellites. And the room, obviously, is uh, it's limited, right? So uh, there's, it's not infinite. So now the governments are taking over these orbits and it's not, we don't have a free market in space. So, you know, the state can do whatever they want. If they want to shoot your satellites down, they're gonna. Um, as far as cybersecurity goes, you know, look at, um, like, uh, you remember that thing with Apple and when they, they had the shooting in San Bernardino and they were trying to get into the guy's phone and the FBI couldn't, but John McAfee could. And they said something to him like, well, how come... Uh, how come you can get into Apple's, uh, you can hack Apple, but the FBI can't? And his response was like, look, I don't mind hiring people who are, you know, have pink hair and a mohawk and smoke pot all day. I don't mind hiring those people because those are the geniuses and the government won't do it. So again, if you want uh, efficient cybersecurity, the state can't provide it. They're incapable of providing this. It has to be market-based. And as long as, uh, we don't have a free market in cybersecurity, you're not going to be secure in a cyber sense. It's not going to happen because the main predator is the state. Absolutely. And that is something that I talked a lot about uh, with Adam Beck, the Blockstream satellite, because you know, he, these amazing cypherpunks and agorists, they have made a, a network of satellites that are propagating the Bitcoin blockchain. And of course, you know, there are several satellites here in, in the space and uh, most of the world is already covered. Uh, but uh, like, do you think that this could e be even further improved uh, when we have a, a complete free society? Oh, absolutely, a hundred percent. Especially when we talk about astropolitics and satellites in orbit and stuff like that, you're only going to get the satellites that are most productive, right? The ones that are most productive have the highest potential to earn revenue. So they're going to be the ones that uh, win out. And the less efficient, like for example, Motorola had a, I can't think of the name now. It's, it's on the tip of my tongue. They have a huge, they had a huge constellation of like GPS satellites or something like that. 
and that went that came crashing down. So, you know, it's all about it's all about the market. It's all about the economics. The market's going to allocate resources to whatever's the most productive uh, actor. Exactly, and I know the the implications of having uh, such technologies available at our fingertips uh, is is quite interesting, and uh, because again, it gives us the option to get the fuck out. Right? It gives us the option to encrypt our conversations, it gives us the option to hide information, to selectively reveal information. And uh, this is something that is really, really important. And it helps us in living a free and peaceful life. Well, that's just the thing, you know, um, like I said earlier, if you don't, if you're going to stay in a hotel, use Airbnb. If you're going to take a taxi, don't use the taxi cartels, use Uber or Lyft. Um, you know, I think there's another one, Uber and Lyft. There's another one I should mention, which I, I think it's called Arcade City or something like that, but it's uh, much more friendly to the libertarian movement. But yeah, the idea is, look, use technologies that allow you to drop out of state institutions. Um, every dollar withheld from the, the tax collection is another dollar for the private sector. It's a dollar or less that they can use to enslave you. You know, the it's all about, like I said, it's all about dropping out. Just Just free yourself. You're free. That's it. Just act like it. You know, that's one of the things, one of the problems I have with anarcho-capitalists is they say, okay, you're free, natural law, you're, yes, we're all free, but don't act like it. Do not act like it. And to me, it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy to tell somebody, look, you're not a slave, but you better show up to pick cotton in the morning and every day. If you don't, we're going to whip you, but you're not a slave. Don't worry. It's like, I'm not stupid. Come on. You know what I mean? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. And then that's actually quite a good comparison. Uh, because, you know, words are well, words. Yeah, words, they have power and the ideas have a lot of power. And fundamentally, what counts is action. Because only action truly manifests change. And if you are not sufficiently in favor of the current situation, well, you have to change it. Not Do me, something. not not someone else, but you. Right. Act. Do well. It's like what is a, a, a th everyone has ever seen the agorist symbol A cubed, uh, agora anarchy action. Uh, you can't be an agorist if there's no action involved, particularly because um, how essential of a role action plays in entrepreneurial activity. Um, again, you know, not to go back to Mises and everything, but that's one of the things he says is that you know only individuals act, and that. As we said earlier, agorism really is just a free market working. Thus, we can simplify it to just saying agorism is simply individuals acting freely. Precisely. That's it. That really is it. Um, so, Sal, we've talked about uh, quite a bit. And I really do think that that was a fantastic conversation. I hope the audience liked it as well. It sure seemed like in the chat quite active. Um, so is this something that we have not yet talked about that you would like to cover? Um, you know, I, I just, I think everybody should, you know, check out the reading. Definitely check out um, that article by Per Byland. That'll help everybody out. Um, I'm going to have him on the show. I don't know when just yet, um, but he's going to, I can't wait to talk to him. Um, yeah, just do the reading. Read read uh, the New Libertarian Manifesto. Read this one by Konkin. This is really... Uh, this is really uh, the book that's going to get us freedom. But also check out the Agorist Primer by Konkin. Check out Community Technology by Carl Hess. Check out um, you know, all of these books. Uh, Agorist Class Theory by Wally Conger, which is another one. You know, that's something I wanted to mention, too, because we get a lot of these comparisons to leftists. And you hear Konkin talk a lot, of it, a lot about how were left libertarians and anarchists. And recently there's been a, left libertarians have gotten a, a rough name in recent history. But um, what I think is interesting to note is in that book by Wally Conger, Agorist Class Theory, one of the things he mentions is the comparison with Marxist class theory and agorist class theory. So in Marxist class theory, you have, uh, we agree with the Marxists that there is, you can divide society into at least two classes. And for Marx, it would be the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, and all that nonsense. But for us, it's the plunderers, the, the plundered versus the plunderers. So we do agree in that sense. Um, and we also do think that the revolution is going to happen from, 
your average everyday working class individual. This is something Rothbard didn't uh, didn't particularly care for. He didn't think that um, the layman had a taste for this. But I, again, I, I really disagree. I think this is the one thing that Rothbard really kind of got wrong because uh, only the individual can do this. And he kind of contradicts himself a little bit when he says that because, you know, like we said, only the individual acts, right? There's no groups in, in states don't act. Only individuals act. So there is a little bit of a contradiction inherent in uh, the anarcho-capitalist critiques of agorism. Yes, we do compare very slightly uh, we do borrow just a tiny, tiny thread from uh, Marxist class theory. Check out the book by Wally Conger um, if you want to learn more about how and why we're compared to leftists. Also, Carl Hess does a good job. Like I said to you earlier, Carl Hess is about as far left as I'll go. Um, he talks about like materialism and how that's a result of the fact that we're a con consumer society. We don't produce anything. So yes, Carl Hess is critical of materialism and consumerism, but that's only based on uh, an inherently fundam fundamentally Austrian approach. Absolutely, yes. It's, it's individuals that act, and that's it. Right? There, there are no states or governments that can have economic action, but only uh, private and peaceful individuals. So yeah. So Pierce, it was amazing uh, talking uh, to Sal here. Uh, check him out on Twitter. Uh, he's a really good follow. And uh, engage him in a, in a nice and fruitful discussion, right? Because that's what Twitter is all about. Uh, you can also uh, check out my Twitter. Uh, my, I uh, hope it's a good follow, but uh, that's for you to decide. <laughs> uh, then uh, right after this one, I'm going to have a episode, The Future Money, uh, uh, both on the Consensus Network and on the World Crypto Network. Uh, but before that, you should check out The Agora, a really, really, really great podcast. And I highly encourage you to, uh, to listen back to the early episodes to get more educated about geopolitics. And, and then uh, later, a great interview with Walter Block also about uh, cyber, uh, uh, space pirates and space, uh, space homesteading, uh, which is quite nice. And maybe something that I really want to uh, show you also um, is this website right here, which in my opinion is a perfect tool for agorists to fund for themselves. Uh, because right here, you guys know, this is the Purism fundraiser uh, to get the, by the way, even more amazing Purism security focused uh, hardware and software products, agorists to the core. And uh, I really want to show you here for, for a few seconds uh, in depth, what Tally, uh, what DJ Booth changed here in this amazing Tally Coin website. So if you go here to the profile, and by the way, this is completely uh, available for everyone. You can link your Twitter page, uh, which will give you your, your profile picture right there, and a little about me page, which you can now edit even. Uh, so you know you can say who you are and what these fundraisers are for. Then you have featured fundraisers from you. It's the, pure, the Purism laptop, right? But there are also other fundraisers. For example, there was the Semitos giveaway where we uh, onboarded a bunch of people to Bitcoin. And here the, the fundraiser to support all these contributors that helped in uh, writing my uh, bachelor thesis on anarchy in money. Okay? What is also really cool is that you can now link all these web pages uh, for your, your Twitter, your YouTube, your podcast, your website, your Patreon even. Uh, but guess what? We no longer need Patreon. It's all Bitcoin. Now. And this is a feature that I really, really like. You can now donate with Bitcoin a specific amount. Let's say $1,000. Uh, let's see. And it will automatically use an extended public key to generate a, a unique address. And this QR code has encrypted that you now send 0 .0, uh, 0.15 Bitcoin um, to this uniquely generated address. Uh, even cooler, in my opinion, you can use Paynims. Paynims is a, a, a rather new version of unique payment accounts. And if you generate this with your Samurai wallet, um, or if you just type in fancy snow 967 which is my Paynim username, on your phone, an individual Bitcoin address is being created. And then you can send money to this. I have no clue which address is going to show up for you. Uh, that's the cool thing. It is completely client side. It increases privacy quite a lot. Uh, and I love that DJ Booth here has both the options 
for um, normal addresses that are generated by a extended public key, but then to increase fungibility, even here the payments. Uh, th that is really, really amazing. And I do truly, truly appreciate all the support uh, that, uh, that you give me for the uh, Purism fundraising to get amazing security-focused laptops for everyone. And if you want to have in-depth analysis and in-depth uh, un unboxings and, and tutorials, uh, then, well, you can buy these videos right here, right? Donate a little bit. We're already 70% there. We could already get a really, uh, the smallest version, but I, I do really would love to get the Librem 15, uh, which is a, a, a great laptop. Uh, so this is something that we agorists really can use to fundraise these projects that, that we truly and, and deeply care about. Uh, and it can be anything. It doesn't have to be here for content creators. This is a platform for you and you decide which projects you will fundraise. Uh, so Sal, again, thank you so much for joining. And uh, what are your last words? Thank you for having me, man. And just like I said, I just hope everybody goes out and reads reads those books and reads that article by Per Byland. And like I said, check out this, the site, salvigoras.com, and read the New Libertarian Manifesto. That's the most important part. Definitely check that book out. Oh, absolutely, right? Acquire all the information, sit down, understand it, and then act. Is 100%. that what agorism is? Act. Absolutely. So, Sal, it has been a pleasure talking to you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see all these upcoming podcasts of yours, which I am quite sure are going to be just as good as the previous ones. Uh, hopefully Thank you. even better. Yeah, I got to get you on the show, man. We got to get you on one day. Talk about uh, Bitcoin and crypto. Oh, well, well, you know, the thing is, your, your episodes are really short, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, which I love, but I ramble a lot. <laughs> and, That's you know, good. one and a half hours. <laughs> but absolutely, I would, I would love to come on the show um, and intermingling of all these podcasts that, that treasure the value of liberty is quite nice. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. For, uh, thank you for having me on. And guys, see you on the next show of Reed Rothbard and use Bitcoin, because action is what it is all about.